Thank you and good morning. I have nothing to disclose. So we do have a new resuscitation algorithm, as I have mentioned in my other talks. And this is the 2015 neonatal resuscitation algorithm for the United States. So this is coming from the American Heart Association and the American Academy of Pediatrics. And what I would point out that in our guidelines, the green rectangles are representing actions that a provider at the bedside in the delivery room are supposed to do. And then the um, elongated hexagons are assessments that the person or team needs to do. The blue represents CPR, that's an AHA color scheme. Um, and we'll go through a lot of this algorithm today using a case, because it's always a little more fun if we put it in the context of a case. I do want you to understand the process of where these guidelines come from and how they come into being. And so really what happens first is the scientific review of resuscitation science. And this is done by the international body called ILCOR, the International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation. And since the year 2000, ILCOR has included a neonatal task force um, for complete review of the newborn resuscitation science every five years. To be part of ILCOR, you have to be sent by a resuscitation council. Some countries have their own resuscitation council, like the United States, Australia, Canada, um, et cetera, but, and they, in South Africa, and they send representatives from their council to ILCOR. In other parts of the world, it is more of a regional organization, um, including the Resuscitation Council of Asia, which represents Japan, um, Korea, and now China is becoming involved. The European Resuscitation Council, which really represents more Western Europe, England, Ireland, Scotland, um, and some of Scandinavia. Um, and then um, the Inter-American Heart Foundation really represents some of Central America and South America. So in the neonatal task force, as far as the um, Inter-American Heart Foundation, we have several representatives from Brazil, Argentina, and Mexico, specifically. So what happens at ILCOR is that this is the evaluation process that's really trying to bring new resuscitation science forward for review. And so the group identifies and prioritizes the questions that need scientific review, and then the reviews get assigned to individual task members. Usually there's two or three reviewers for every question that we are looking at because this takes a lot of work and you need multiple sets of eyes coming to agreement on what the science is telling us. The minimum requirements for every search strategy are very specified, and these are actually done by professional librarians that are hired by ILCOR. They search diligently with the help of the reviewer, helping them hone in on um, proper search words, et cetera. They search all of Medline, Embase, which is more of the European um, repository for literature, and Cochrane systematic reviews, and then they do a lot of hand searches as well to make sure that they capture every article possible on the subject matter. Every reviewer then rates the level and quality of evidence using a standardized evidence evaluation. And we're using what's called the GRADE system, which has been now recommended by the US Institute of Medicine as the systematic way that systematic reviews should be done. And then a consensus for each question is reached by the, neon the entire neonatal task force. And this meeting happens every five years, and most recently this was in February of 2015. Once the science is agreed upon, this is put into a document that's called the Consensus on Science and Treatment Recommendation Document. Um, and that comes out um, every five years. And it's co-published in Circulation, Resuscitation, and the neonatal and pediatric portions are also co-published in pediatrics, since it's many of our um, audience of, that would be interested would take pediatrics. And then, what I need you to understand is this consensus on science document comes from ILCOR. Then the resuscitation councils take the science and develop their own guidelines. And that has also come out with simultaneous publication on October 15th for the United States, published in Circulation, Resuscitation, and Pediatrics. And you can download 
Um, these articles, if you go to www.heart.org backslash CPR, it's not super easy. You actually have to click on multiple other links, but this will get you started and you can find the articles. I'm gonna give you some more specific links at the very end for the neonatal articles. So again, this is our algorithm for 2015, and I think we should jump in. Oh, I'm sorry, I wanted to mention. So with the, this is the um, guidelines um, algorithm that has come from the AAP and the American Heart Association. And then for the United States, this algorithm serves as just the backbone that will get translated into the neonatal resuscitation program um, educational program, and that's done by the American Academy of Pediatrics NRP Steering Committee. Um, the seventh edition book and materials and posters and all of those sorts of educational items will be out sometime in April and May of 2016. And then the ex expectation for the United States is that those guidelines should be adopted by January 1st, 2017. So I'm gonna hit some highlights of what those changes are in the next 30 minutes, but since we only have 30 minutes, we literally will be just touching on some of the highlights, but that doesn't mean that tomorrow you have to go back and start doing these changes. We need to do it in a systematic way, educate your teams, educate your OBs, um, and figure out how you're gonna roll out these guidelines in your own place, um, and it doesn't have to be done until January 1st, 2017. Okay, so what are some of the hot topics that we're gonna try to address today? I'm sorry, I put these in a little bit out of order. We're gonna look at the overview of the algorithm. We're gonna look at whether cord camp clamping should be delayed for neonates who are non-vigorous. We're gonna look at does intubation and suction benefit the non-vigorous meconium stained neonate? We're gonna think very briefly, and we've already talked about this, about how heart rate should be determined in the delivery room. We're going to focus on the imperative of effective ventilation and I just wanna highlight that there really haven't been any substantial changes in the actual CPR recommendations when we're talking about compressions or medications. Most of those um, previous recommendations will still stand. Okay, so let's get on to a case to kind of put all of this in perspective. So you are on call at your delivery hospital. I'm very excited because we have a brand new delivery hospital, Parkland. This is the old Parkland that was built in the early 1950s. And as of August 20th, we moved into new Parkland, which absolutely dwarfs the old Parkland. And that is awesome, but it also brings a lot of new challenges because we have 44 labor and delivery rooms and nine operating rooms and over 12,000 deliveries. And since we have opened in August 20th, our deliveries are up 40%. So I'm shuddering to think what our numbers are gonna be after a year there. Um, and obviously we are never bored. So we're on call and you get a call and you are needed stat to OR9 on labor and delivery. And upon entering the operating room with your team, you have to first ask the four questions in order to brief your team and set up the appropriate equipment. So the four questions haven't changed. You go in the room, you need to know the baby's gestation, how many babies are there? What is the status of the amniotic fluid? And are there additional risk factors, which if a neonatologist is being called, I would assume there are going to be some additional risk factors. And this helps us focus in on the team briefing and equipment check. Obviously, we would like to do antenatal counseling beforehand, and we have put that into the algorithm to help all remind us the importance of antenatal counseling, but in this case, you're already being called to the delivery. So briefing and an equipment check are very important. And what the obstetrician team tells you is that they have a 19-year-old G1P0 who's had no prenatal care. She's having intense abdominal pain and vaginal bleeding. Her membranes at this time appear to be intact, and there's no history of trauma. The bedside sono suggests that it's a 38-week singleton, and an additional risk factor is that they're very worried because there appears to be agonal fetal bradycardia. And so because of that, they're doing a stat C-section under general anesthesia. So you're thinking about these risk factors and what can go wrong before birth that can affect transition. You guys know that if the difficulty begins in utero, the problem usually reflects compromised blood flow in the placenta or umbilical cord, which results in asphyxia. And that asphyxia is the lack of gas exchange and that there are two gases that matter to us. It's not just hypoxia, it's the fact that there is profound CO2 elevation that we are also going to have to deal with. 
and there are many antepartum risk factors that can result in compromised blood flow, including things like maternal diabetes and preeclampsia, multiple gestations, and there are also intrapartum risk factors like choreo, and in this case, we have a lot of hints from the clinical story that perhaps there is an abruption underway. So how are you going to prepare? You'd have to have a team in this high, very high-risk situation of a STAT C-section with agonal bradycardia. Preferably, you would like to have a team that is trained together, and you need to clearly assign roles. Now, I completely understand that this is a long list of people that may not actually exist in your clinical situation, but I am laying out for you what I think is the optimal team and number of people for an extremely high-risk delivery where there is a chance that you might have to actually do CPR. You need one person who can truly just be the team leader, who is not going to be jumping in and trying to do procedures or get their hands doing, the worst thing they could do would be to actually be responsible for cardiac compressions and things that take rhythm. This person needs to have the big picture and be giving commands. You need to have some kind of medical provider at the head of the bed. That could be an MD, it could be an NMP. You need a good respiratory therapist. Um, I like to have an experienced neonatal nurse as my assessor. And then in addition, some other kind of provider. In our system, we use an NMP who could do procedures like placing the line. And then a nurse to drop the meds. And very importantly, a member of your team should be a recorder who uses either a standardized form where the data is being recorded real time as to what the team is doing and the infant's responses or video. So you gather and prepare your equipment and you're gonna need all the stuff you need for every routine delivery. But in this case where there is a chance you might have to do CPR and give meds, you should go ahead and decide on an estimated weight based on the gestation. And you could potentially go ahead and prepare an umbilical catheter or drop the IV epinephrine doses and label them um, in preparation for such a delivery because this will greatly cut down the time to IV epinephrine, which can be key. You at least need to lay out your things and know where they're going to be. So I like to give a few reminders to my team because this can be very stressful to the group to remind them that we resuscitate babies every day and we're darn good at it. And we need to stay focused on effective PPV, including intubation if it's needed. Because when we do that, 999 out of 1,000 babies will respond to the effective ventilation. Those numbers come from data from Parkland. We have to remind ourselves not to ventilate too fast because our adrenaline is gonna be jacked up through the roof and it's very easy to bag very fast. We don't wanna do that. We wanna allow time for the CO2 to actually come out. We're gonna secure the endotracheal tube if intubated. I've been in some situations where the team was so stressed out they started CPR without having the tube in place and quickly lost the airway. And the reminders that in this high risk situation of prof where there may be profound bradycardia or asystole, that once we intubate, the colorimetric in tidal CO2 may not change color even if the intubation is successful and that the pulse ox may not pick up and that if compressions are needed, we're going to turn the oxygen to 100%. Okay, the OB says uterine incision, thick meconium. The infant is limp and has no respiratory effort. So um, I don't know if we can do a slide thing or if we should just do a, sh maybe we'll just do a thing of hands. Um, what would you do first in this situation? Would you encourage the OB to delay cord clamping? How many wanna do that? How many wanna take the infant to the warmer for initial steps? How many want to intubate and suction before the initial steps are done? And how many wanna place the baby on the mom's chest to initiate breastfeeding and the bonding process? Okay, well I got some hardcore people back there. Um, so in this situation, we actually want to, we would not recommend delayed cord clamping because this is a baby in need of resuscitation. And our recommendation now is that yes, delayed cord clamping can be useful and considered, but not in the context of a baby who's needing resuscitation. We don't know that that would be safe. And in this case in particular, when you're talking about abruption, where there is no gas exchange, it makes no sense to stay connected to the placenta. So <clears throat> in 2015, the um, delayed cord clamping for 30 to 60 seconds for most is recommended for most vigorous term and preterm babies. And in that situation, when they're vigorous, you can place them skin to skin with mom afterwards. 
there is no delay if placental circulation is uh, um, disrupted. And in, there is insufficient evidence um, regarding the timing of cord clamping if the baby is not vigorous. So we would suggest to bring the baby to the warmer for the initial steps, and obviously this is gonna take a lot of good communication and teamwork with our obstetrical team. One thing that's been asked, and I just wanna highlight according for the Academy of Pediatrics, is that the time of birth is still the time when the baby emerges from the mother, not the time of the cord clamping. And so yes, you would start the APGAR timer just as soon as the baby emerges from the mother. Okay, so do we still intubate and suction every non-vigorous meconium exposed infant? And the answer is no. This is one of the bigger changes in the new guidelines, that routine tracheal suction is no longer recommended for non-vigorous babies with meconium stained amniotic fluid. And this is based on a couple of things. The evidence in the past that we used was very weak evidence. And in the past five-year cycle, we do now have one randomized controlled trial um, that showed that in the non-vigorous meconium stained baby, the intubation and suctioning made absolutely no difference in the rates of meconium aspiration syndrome, the need for ventilation, or the days in the ICU. It is only one trial, but that in context of a population of pediatric providers that have less and less intubation skill. The recommendation was based on evaluating of getting a baby to the warmer and getting the positive pressure ventilations started sooner since there's no evidence that this intervention is making any difference. Now, we still need a provider who has both PPV and intubation skills present at the birth of infants born through meconium stained fluid because we know that those infants do have a much higher need for effective positive pressure ventilation. And we will still need to practice the skill of intubation and suction for the rare case where the meconium results in airway obstruction. But think about all of the children that you have intubated and suctioned who are non-vigorous and how rare it is that you get any meconium up. And then in addition to that, we're talking about only doing this if once you start positive pressure ventilation, you can't get chest dries and the airway is obstructed. This will be the incredibly rare situation. All right, so in our case, we're taking the baby to the radiant warmer and we're judging still the same three um, assessments as we're going. Is this baby term? We've already said yes. Does this baby have good tone? We've already heard no. Is the baby breathing or crying? And the answer is no. So they don't get to stay with their mother. They're going to the radiant warmer. And now we're going to focus on the initial steps of resuscitation. And one of the things you will notice that beyond saying warm the baby, we now say warm and maintain normal temperature. And so we want to do that and position the baby in the open airway position. We will suction only if needed, and that's if they're not clearing their own airway. In the cases of apnea or those children who are trying to cry but are drowning in their own secretions. And then we would dry them and stimulate. Um, and after those initial steps, the questions haven't changed. Is this baby apneic or gasping? And is the heart rate below 100? And then if the answer is yes, we're gonna go down the pathway to more interventions. So in 2015, as we discussed um, two days ago, the heart rate still remains the most important indicator of successful resuscitation. And in the algorithm, we say that the initial heart rate can be assessed by auscultation, a reminder that palpation of the umbilical cord is less reliable and less accurate. Now at this point, the nurse reports, I can't hear a heart rate. So how many of you would like to start cardiac compressions now? How many want to place the baby skin to skin with mom? How many want to initiate positive pressure ventilation? Let's have all the hands go up. Um, how many now want to intubate and suction for meconium? All right, can't fool you guys. The answer is we must now focus on positive pressure ventilation. We don't jump ahead to cardiac compressions. The indications for cardiac compressions have not changed. Chest compressions are indicated when the heart rate is below 60 despite providing the initial steps and 30 seconds of effective assisted ventilation where we focus on the Mr. Sopa steps to achieve this, including an advanced airway. And we note that because chest compressions are likely to compete with effective ventilation, 
Rescuers are always encouraged to ensure that the assisted ventilation is delivered optimally before initiation of chest compressions. And there is a recent paper in 2015, this is from Jeff Perlman's group at Cornell, um, where they did a simulation study and they looked with respiratory mechanics monitors and flow monitors and about how effective the positive pressure was once people started mask CPR. Um, and it was very poor. And people couldn't even judge when he would change the compliance of the lung. They had no sense that they needed to change their strategy with the ventilation. So we really think it's getting that airway secured is very important before starting compressions. Okay, so we're supposed to now focus on PPV. We do mention that at this point, you should probably place your pulse oximeter and you could consider the ECG monitor. Um, there are no changes in the recommendation for pulse oximetry this time around. Every delivery must have an oximeter readily available, and we use that oximeter whenever resuscitation is anticipated, when positive pressure ventilation is administered for more than a few breaths, when cyanosis is persistent, when supplemental oxygen is administered, and for all infants less than 32 weeks gestation. As far as what initial oxygen concentration we recommend. The initial FiO2 for PPV for those infants that are greater than or equal to 35 week gestation remains room air. And for those less than 35 weeks, we recommend the 21 to 30%. And we're using the same minute by minute term baby saturation goals as the goal for adjusting our oxygen. We have already talked about this two days ago, that although our initial heart rate can be assessed by auscultation, that once PPV begins, we can consider placing the electronic cardiac monitor, and that once chest compressions begin, if they are needed, then we recommend that you truly do use the ECG monitor. So in this case, we're here, we are now assessing, we've done, started some PPV and we've placed our pulse oximeter and we need to assess whether our heart rate is below 100 beats per minute. And for our baby's case, we are bagging at 25 over five, and we're noticing that on the T-piece resuscitator, and um, we're hitting the pressures that we had preset, and so we therefore know that we do not have a mask leak. We've checked that the baby's in the sniffing position, the mouth is open, but there's still kind of poor chest rise, so we try a higher pressure of 30 centimeters of water, but the heart rate remains 40 and is not rising. And at this point, our nurse is trying to attach the ECG leads. Now, we went through a lot of the Mr. Sopa steps to achieve effective ventilation. We did the MRSOP, but we had not yet done the airway. And so, as a reminder, the intubation is strongly recommended prior to compressions. And so we intubate and the tube is adjusted to the proper depth and we're looking for equal breath sounds heard and the chest rise is then noted. And we put on the entitled CO2 detector to confirm the tube placement and our nurse and RT report that there is no color change. It remains purple. So how many of you would like to immediately pull the tube and try again? How many want to determine other confirmatory markers? How many of you would move ahead without a second thought? And how many want to try some more stimulation? All right. We really need to, in this situation to determine other confirmatory markers, like do you see chest rise with bi and do you hear bilateral breath sounds? Do you see mist in the tube? Do you have an appropriate tip to lip measurement? Did the provider confidently say that they saw it pass between the cords? And if there's any question, you can visually confirm with a lorenzoscope. We don't want to immediately pull the tube unless the person says, hey, I, I don't think I even got between the cords, because we know that in tidal CO2 detection during a systole can give you a false negative. Your positive pressure during the resuscitation removes the CO2 that's present in the lungs prior to a systole, and the CO2 production decreases as cellular metabolism slows, and with cessation of blood flow remaining, the remaining CO2 cannot reach the lungs. And so you have no CO2 detected even when intubated. So just be very cautious with that. So next steps for our baby, we provide PPV through the endotracheal tube and determine that the heart rate response in about 10 to 20 seconds. We see that the chest is moving and we've secured the endotracheal tube, but still the nurse reports that the heart rate is 40 and not rising. And the pulse oximeter, as you guys know, won't even pick up in this situation. So we now increase our oxygen to 100%. As I mentioned previously, this is based on a lot of animal studies, um, really no clinical data, but that is still our recommendation that if you're going to start CPR, 
to move your oxygen to 100%. And then we initiate cardiac compressions. These guidelines remain unchanged. We are still recommending that you compress to a depth of one-third the AP diameter of the chest. You compress the lower one-third of the sternum. You use the technique, the two-thumb technique, which even our presidential candidates in the U.S. seem to understand. And we have a three-to-one compression to ventilation ratio for asphyxial arrest. And then we coordinate the compressions and ventilations to avoid simultaneous delivery and avoid frequent interruptions in compressions. I think there's been a lot of interest in whether we still need to coordinate compressions and ventilations. And I would just like to point out that we have only one animal study that has really looked at this, and it's in a post-transitioned model, not even an actual transitional model with fluid in the lung and the duct open. And in that paper, there was no advantage to not um, to doing uncoordinated compressions and ventilations. And in fact, at the time of return of spontaneous circulation, the CO2 was still in the 90s for the group where it was not being coordinated. And in addition, um, there's now just recently um, came out a randomized controlled trial of coordination in the older population, which is the, where this all stemmed from. And now they have concerns that actually that may not be a good idea even in the adult population. Very interesting, we're gonna have to really keep our eye on that. So, the cardiac compressions should be done from the head of the bed. We have now our cardiac monitor on, um, and we continue the CPR coordinated three to one for 60 seconds prior to checking our heart rate. And for the United States, that's a slight change. We used to say 45 to 60 seconds, now we want you to go a complete minute before you interrupt to check for the heart rate, and if you have the ECG on, you won't need to interrupt and check for the heart rate until the heart rate on the monitor comes above 60. Reminders, be aware of the many pauses in circulation that can inadvertently come up during CPR and help your team stay focused on optimizing perfusion. We've mentioned the need for the ECG. Be aware that the pulse oximeter will likely not pick up during this time, or if it does, the heart rate that you see on it will more likely reflect the compression rate than an actual heart rate. The ECG tracing will help guide you as to when to pause for auscultation. If the heart rate's less than 60 on the monitor, continue your CPR, and if it's greater than 60, confirm by auscultation. There's no major changes in the medications. There are only still for us, thank God, two meds to remember, epinephrine, IV remains preferred, IO is okay. The endotracheal dose can be used while achieving intravascular access, but we know that that is not very effective. And then we also still will need to remember in special cases where there appears to be volume loss, the potential need for normal saline or O negative blood. Um, the dosing for the epinephrine has not changed. It's still the one to 10,000. And for the IV dose, which is our preferred route, it's 0.01 to 0.03 milligrams per kilo. We want to make that umbilical line placement a priority if epinephrine is needed because the endotracheal delivery is unreliable. And if you are going to try a dose of endotracheal, it's still the 0.05 to 0.1 milligram per kilo dose that may be given. So in our baby, two minutes after the first dose of IV epinephrine, the ECG heart rate says that the heart rates come up to 80. The team stops to listen and, and confirms that the heart rate is indeed above 60 and rising. The chest compressions are stopped. The positive pressure ventilation is continued. The OB now is reporting to you that they do see 50% abruption. You ask for a cord gas, get that baby to your NICU as quickly as possible, and notify your cooling center. Likely this child would qualify for cooling. You need to get a gas, and you need to be very um, quick to monitor the sugar and correct any hypoglycemia. The last change in the algorithm is, it doesn't seem like it's that big a deal, but it really could make a difference um, for ongoing improvements in your teams. And that is that after every intensive resuscitation, we really need to debrief. Um, this is, again, the algorithm. The ventilation truly remains the focus. That's not any different from the past, just some minor tweaks that we're making along the way. Um, I'd like to thank the AAP for some of the drawings and photos that I used in this. And these are the two links that I want to make sure you have. The top one will get you the actual ILCOR consensus on science statement. Um, and then the bottom one will get you the actual U.S. guidelines. But if you're from another region, you're going to need to make sure um, either your, if your country decides to use the U.S. guidelines, fine. 
every other region, they roll out the new guidelines at a different time. The only other one that I know is out is the ERC has published their guidelines for the coming five years. So thank you.